Gospel Broadcasting Network, a cooperative effort of Churches of Christ, brings you good news today and every day. That's the morning's first traffic report. We'll have a look at today's weather forecast in a moment, but first, the news. I'm happy today, oh yes, I'm happy today, another new day to sing and to pray. With the sun in my heart, the clouds are not gray, and that's why I'm happy today. I'm walking today, oh yes, I'm walking today, with God's holy book to show me the way, because I know what to do, and know what to say, and that's why I'm happy today. Welcome to Good News. News today, the program where you will always find good news, no matter what else is happening in the world. This is the Saturday edition of Good News Today, and you know what that means. It means we have some special segments in store for you for our uh, young people and the young at heart, as we say. Of course, we want you to be turning to the 66th Psalm. Psalm 66, we're going to be looking at the first, uh, first 12 ver verses of Psalm 66 in our devotional time with which we begin every Good News Today program. But uh, let me tell you some of the other things that are coming your way on the Saturday edition of our program. Uh, we will be joined a little bit later on by our archaeologist friend, Gary Hill. And he brings along uh, an artifact today he's going to tell us about, an Egyptian artifact. That's a part of our Life in the Past Lane segment that's coming up a little bit uh, later on. Caleb Colley is on the rock telling us that uh, anger and prayer don't mix and talking about godly anger management. And yes, uh, another trip to the underground on this Saturday edition of Good News Today. Digger Doug's Underground, of course, with Digger Doug, Iguana Don, Willie the Word Worm, Professor White Coat, and all the gang as we take a trip with them to the Museum of Natural History. And the Saturday edition of Tom's Pastime Porch, where Tom, along with his Saturday friend Spot, uh, rock and reminisce with us from the Pastime Porch. And Robert Hatfield, shares an interesting study done at UCLA about students' attitudes toward religion. What about tolerance and their attitudes uh, toward other religions in terms of being tolerant of them? Well, Robert Hatfield reminds us that we, we cannot violate God's word in the name of tolerance. It's another Truth For Youth segment that you will not want to miss. Well, that's what's coming your way on uh, the Saturday edition of Good News Today, but right now what comes your way is our devotional time. Scripture reading, beautiful singing and scenery, and then a brief study of our passage. Let's read together from Psalm 66. We'll read the first 12 verses. Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Sing out the honor of His name. Make His praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. Come and see the works of God. He is awesome in his doing toward the sons of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the river on foot. There we will rejoice in him. He rules by his power forever. His eyes observe the nations. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves. O oh, bless our God, you peoples, and make the voice of his praise to be heard, who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved. For you, O oh God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but you brought us out to rich fulfillment.
We are back to uh, briefly study now from Psalm 66, the first 12 verses. The reading begins with, Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. A joyful shout. You know, those who are children of God are the most joyful people on earth. And they should express that joy not only to others, but obviously to the God of heaven and should praise God. God. All the earth should praise God if indeed uh, the earth, uh, all on the earth would, uh, would think as they should think, they would praise God and recognize His goodness and, and greatness. They would sing out the honor of His name and make His praise uh, glorious. They would recognize the awesome nature of His works. And yet, uh, tragically, many deny that God even created this great and vast universe in which we live. But the greatness of his power is all around us if we will but open our eyes and see the greatness of his power. And our young people especially need to learn from the earliest age the overwhelming evidence that exists for the existence of God, for the fact that God created this universe. And therefore, since he created us, then surely he would communicate with us. And he has in his word. Well, verse 4 all the earth shall worship you again. All the earth should praise him. Uh, and ultimately, all will have to submit to his power. It's reminiscent of what, uh, what we find over in Philippians chapter 2, uh, where after Paul writes about uh, Christ humbling himself at verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, and talks about his mind of submission uh, that uh, caused him to uh, give up equality with God and come to this earth and live among men and then to die and shed his blood for our sins. Then in verse 9, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth. In verse 11, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, we should do that now. And if we don't do that now, then when we are forced to recognize that power, it will be too late when he comes again. Now is the time to come and see the works of God. Verse 5 of Psalm 66, he is awesome in his doing toward the sons of men. We should see God's existence in creation, as we said, the design demands a designer. And in verse 6 of our reading, the psalmist reminds us that he turned the sea into dry land. They went through the river on foot. Well, of course, uh, uh, at the parting of the Red Sea, and then there was rejoicing on the other side. They rejoiced on the other side of the, of the Red Sea. And then, of course, at the Jordan, that, the Jordan River was stopped as well uh, at a later time. God demonstrated his power to his people of old, and we can read of that power and, uh, and see that power as we read the record of God's demonstration of his miraculous power in past time. And God today works not through the miraculous, but through the providential realm. But we can certainly appreciate his presence and appreciate his providence with us as through natural means he provides for his own. And the general providence of God should be seen by all mankind. He makes the rain to fall on the just and on the unjust. He rules by his power forever. Verse 7, he, his eyes observe the nations. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves. That's an interesting statement. His eyes observe the nations. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves. In other words, don't think that anything is hidden from the all-seeing eye of God. Those who exalt themselves and rebel against God will ultimately be brought low. Proverbs 16, 18. 
Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And the rebellious will be brought low. Then in verse... Uh, Verse 8, oh, bless our God, you peoples, and make the voice of his praise to be heard. Here is a further call to praise God. Verse 9, who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved. Go back with me to Psalm 55. This statement that we've just read reminds us of another statement, most reassuring statement that, that the psalmist makes in Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Isn't that a great text? Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved moved. And here in the 66th Psalm, that same thought is expressed. He does not allow our feet to be moved. Now, does that mean that we will never be uh, tested, that we will never endure trials? No, the very next statement of this Psalm points out that indeed we will. For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. He goes on, you brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but you brought us out, notice this in the final thought of our reading, you brought us out to rich fulfillment. Rich reward ultimately awaits the faithful who endure the testing and the trials. No, God is not going to shield us from uh, every trial. He's not going to shield his people from all suffering, but God has provided the means for us to be made better rather than bitter from that suffering. In fact, Hebrews 12 talks about uh, the chastening of the Lord, discipline, the, uh, the idea of trials that do come our way. And we are told, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. Verse 6 of Hebrews 12, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. When we go on over to, to what James uh, tells us about this matter. My brethren, James 1 verse 2, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have, have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And then down at verse 12 of James 1, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. That's that rich reward that the psalmist speaks of here in verse 12, reminds us of that rich reward that awaits the faithful. No, we are not shielded from trials. God never tempts us to sin. He cannot be tempted to sin. He does not tempt us to sin. But he does not shield us from trials and tests that will indeed strengthen us if we will rely upon the Word of God uh, during those difficulties will come out the other side in, in a stronger position than ever. Only the Christian has that ability to do that based upon his reliance upon the God of heaven. Well, that's our devotional time right now. We take time to give you some contact information. We'd like to hear from you. And as we go to that break to give you that contact information, we'll remind you of some of the congregations that bring you good news today. Each step I take, my Savior goes before me, and with His loving hand He leads away. And with each breath I whisper, I adore Thee. Oh, what joy to walk with Him each day. Each day.
You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you'd like to receive free Bible study materials, contact us. You may write us at Good News Today, P.O. Box 23604, Chattanooga, Tennessee, 37422. Again, that's Good News Today, P.O. Box 23604, Chattanooga, Tennessee, 37422. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstoday at gbntv.org. Again, that's goodnewstoday at gbntv.org. Or call us toll free at 1-888-805-3390. That's 1-888-805-3390. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our viewers is always good news to us. This is program 667, 667. If you'd like a free DVD or audio CD of it, we'll be glad to send that to you. Right now, it's time for Life in the Past Lane. Let's join our archaeologist friend, Gary Hill. For today's artifact, we're going to be looking at an interesting little Egyptian here. This little Egyptian is called a you sharp day. And of course, as you look at this artifact, this you sharp day, this is found in an Egyptian tomb and it was wrapped in the mummies. And it was a little Egyptian good luck god or goddess. And as you can see on the artifact here, it has Egyptian hieroglyphics, some of the earliest form of writing in the ancient world. Writing is interesting. Writing is interesting in the ancient world because one of the things the skeptics have always said is that Moses could not have written the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, and other things such as that. Well, this shows Egyptian writing. Moses, as a matter of fact, the Bible says, was learned in all the wisdom of Egypt. In other words, Moses was a scribe, could write, could do research, and certainly was well qualified by his life as the prince in Egypt to write the first five books of our Bible. Also, we need to recognize that this being a little Egyptian god or goddess is against what the Bible teaches concerning the one true God. And the great conflict between the Egyptian gods and the one true God, of course, that we read about in the scriptures is found in the 10 plagues. If you will, open your Bible with me to the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, during the seventh plague, the plague of hell, God talks about the plagues had come upon Egypt. Starting at verse 14, he said, At that time I will send all my plagues to your very heart, Notes. and on your servants, and on and your people, show more controls. that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Now that I have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you shall have been cut off from the earth. But instead... For this purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Why did the plagues happen? To show the name and glorify the power of God. Also, another reason the plagues happened is because God wanted to show us his eternal love for his people. And as we study archaeology, which illuminates and illustrates the Bible. We find stories, we find artifacts, we find things to help us understand the Bible better. And in understanding the Bible better, the more we understand how God loves us. Thank you. Well, we leave the past lane and move to the rock where we'll spend a little time with Caleb Colley who has some thoughts for us today about uh, godly anger management. Here's Caleb. 
Christians can pray to God anytime, anywhere. He hears our prayers, but I suppose that our frame of mind might make it very difficult to pray. For example, Paul wrote to the young preacher Timothy that men should pray without wrath or anger. In general, anger and prayer don't mix. Paul wrote in Ephesians 4.20, Six, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. It's not wrong to be angry, but we must be careful about how we deal with our anger. If it causes us to sin, which it very easily can do, we have not handled our anger well. I'm afraid that some Christians need to learn godly anger management. We should not let our anger come between us and a healthy relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We should do our best to work out our disagreements so that we can build up the church, and so our prayers will not be hindered. Paul also wrote in Colossians 3.21 that fathers should not provoke their children to wrath or anger. And again in Ephesians 4.31 that Christians should put away anger. A hot temper is a dangerous thing. Godly teenagers keep their emotions under control so that anger never hinders them from approaching the throne of God. Join us next time on The Rock. A trip to the uh, Museum of Natural History is on the agenda today as we join Digger Doug, Iguana Don, and all the gang for another episode of Digger Doug's Underground. Welcome to the underground where Iguana Don loves to play around. Come into the science place. Digger Doug is the answer base. It's a mall. Singing sycamore tree, join the other kids. It's so much fun you'll see. It's a mall where the facts are found. It's a mall. It's digger dust underground. This movie is going to be so exciting! Have you seen this movie before? I can't wait to see all those huge dinosaurs coming up on the screen. It's gonna be great! Oh, I'm Down in front! I can't see what? over that huge red hat! Oh, oh okay, uh, sorry about that. Great! Oh, uh, hey everybody! The movie is starting! Oh, man! I got my hand stuck in my popcorn! I can't get it out! Oh, no! Get it out! I... Hi, kids! Welcome to the underground. I'm waiting on my good friend Iguanodon to arrive. He said he would stop by on his way home from the movies. I could tell you about my favorite. Oh, I'll tell you later. Hey, Digga Doug! Hey, Digga Doug! Let me in, Digga Doug! Let me in, let me in! Hey, Iggy, the door is unlocked. Come on in. All right. Hey, Digga, what's going on? Uh, Iggy, why do you have a popcorn bag stuck on your hand? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess this was the largest size popcorn they had at the movie, Doug. I told the popcorn guy that I needed the great big huge mongus dino size, but this is all he gave me. Anyway, I reached in for some popcorn and I just couldn't get the bag off my cloth. Well, you want to try to get it off? Yeah, maybe if you pull, Doug. All right, let's give it a try. Uh, I guess we're going to need a broom, huh, Digger Doug? Yeah. Next time we go to the movies, I'm taking my own boat. Good idea. Well, did you like the movie? Oh, yeah, Digger. I think it was just about the greatest movie I've ever seen. It had action. It had suspense. It had comedy. It had... Did night. it have it had... a story? Oh, oh, yeah, sure. It was about lots of great big dinosaurs in the jungle. Ferocious dinosaurs? You saw the movie, too? No, I... Have you ever seen one in real life? No, but... I, I thought you had seen every kind of animal, Digger Doug. Well, nobody alive today has ever seen a real dinosaur. They're... Oh, I know, I know. They're extinct. Right, Iggy. What I want to know is what extincted the dinosaur. You mean what made the dinosaurs become extinct? Yeah, that's what I said. That's what I said. That's a good question. To help us answer, let's take a little trip. Oh, to Antarctica? Well... Let me get my coat. No, Iggy. We don't have to go to Antarctica. We're going to the Natural History Museum. Oh, okay, that's just down the street, not too far from the underground. Right. Why do we need to go to the Natural History Museum? Do they have a dead dinosaur? 
Just wait and see, Iggy. Wait and see. Okay, but can we stop at Dave's Diner on the way to the museum? I lost most of my popcorn, so I'm still kind of hungry. Sure thing, Iggy. I wouldn't mind a dino burger myself. Ooh, have you heard up this new song I made? It said, I love dino burger. Oh, so tender and juicy. Hey, I love the ketchup. Ooh, but I love the meat the most. I'm Willie the Word Worm, bringing you the facts and nothing but the facts. It's time for the word of the day, and today we actually have two words. Natural history. History is a story of the past, things that have already happened. Things that are natural are things that happen in nature, in the world around us. So, natural history is the story of what has happened in nature in the past. And a natural history museum contains things about, you guessed it, natural history. I repeat, natural history tells the story of what has happened in the past in the world around us. I'm Willie the Word Worm, providing the news and the truth. Hey, Sing Along Sycamore. Hey, Digger Doug. Hello, Iggy. Where are you guys heading on this beautiful day? Well, to the National Crematorium. That's the Natural History Museum, Iggy. Right, right. That's what I said, Doug. That's what I said. Wow, they have some really nice trees over there. Tell them I said hello. Uh, okay, sure thing, Sick. Inside the museum, they also have a lot of big... Wait, 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 I, I haven't told Iggy about the cool, you know what, over at the Natural History Museum. Oh, come on, tell me, tell me, I just want to, come on, tell me, tell me. I think singing Sycamore and I'll just let you be surprised. <laughs> That's right. Why don't we sing a song? Okay, if y'all won't tell me what's in the Natural History Museum, I guess we can sing a song. How about... God made Adam from the dust. Oh, okay, right. that'd be great. great. That'd be great. That's saying. God made Adam from the dust, from the dust, from the dust. God made Adam from the dust and breathed into him life. God made Eve from Adam's rib, Adam's rib, Adam's rib. God made Eve from Adam's rib to be his loving wife. They lived in a garden home, garden home, garden home. They lived in a garden home and Eden was its name. Wow, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, that's one of my favorite songs. All right, all right, let's go to the museum. All right, let's go. See you right. later, sing along. See you later, Digger Dog. Bye, Iggy. Hey. Have fun at the Natural History Museum. We'll do All it. Right. See you. All right. Bye-bye. You just heard the words of the day. Natural history. Keep listening for this very important phrase. Remember, natural history is the story of what has happened in the past in the world around us. Sing your favorite song at the singing sycamore tree. The more we read the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the more we read the Bible, the happier we'll be. We'll learn about Jesus and how we can serve him. The more we read the Bible, the happier we'll be. Very good. We're going to sing the songs of the New Testament. Why don't you sing along with us? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts and letters to the Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, Titus and Philemon, Hebrews, James, First and Second Peter. Fishy swim? God. God did. Kids, why don't you sing this song with us? Who made the fishy swim? Fishy swim, fishy swim. Who made the fishy swim? God in heaven above us. Who made the flowers grow? Flowers grow, flowers grow. Who made the flowers grow? God in heaven above us. Who made the birdies 
slide, birdie slide, birdie slide. Who made the birdie slide? God in heaven above us. Who made both you and I? You and I, you and I. Who made both you and I? God in heaven above us. Who made the fishy swim? Flowers grow, birdie slide. Who made both you and I? God in heaven above. There would be dinosaurs at the Natural History Museum. Oh, look, there's a huge triceratops. Uh, oh, yeah, well, well, uh, uh, I, I was getting it. Yes, triceratops. That's exactly what I was about to say, Doug. I think I am really going to like this museum. I think so, too, Iggy. You know, a lot of people think that dinosaurs like Triceratops lived millions of years before humans came on the scene. Yeah, that's what my science teacher, Mr. Badger, says. He's a really smart badger. But sometimes he says things that aren't exactly the same as what the Bible says. Well, just because a scientist says something doesn't mean it's true. For a long time, scientists thought the Earth was flat. But that's crazy! We all know the Earth is a big ball! Of course, we know the Earth is a sphere. The point is, scientists don't know everything and it's possible for them to be wrong. So, all the scientists who say that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago are wrong? That's exactly right, Iggy. One doctor named Gideon Mantell found one of the very first dinosaur fossils. Ooh, ooh, what kinds of fossils did Tigley and Marshall find? In the early 1820s, Gideon Mantell found lots of dinosaur teeth. And also, at the Natural Bridges National Monument in Utah, at the bridge known as Kachina, an Indian petroglyph of a dinosaur was discovered. It had a neck like a dinosaur, a tail like a dinosaur, and both creationists and evolutionists have said it looks like a dinosaur. Nobody could have drawn those pictures unless they had either seen a dinosaur or been told what one looked like. Well, that does make sense. I mean, I wouldn't have any idea how to draw something unless I had seen it or somebody told me what it looked like. Uh, plus, I am a fantastic artist. Did you ever see that time I drew that big super picture of the monstrous, magnificent... The uh, rock drawing is called a petroglyph. Oh, yeah, a, a pecormicoph. No, a, a petroglyph. Yeah, right, isn't that what I say? Well... Oh, wait a second, Dick Duck. Why do those scientists care whether dinosaurs lived millions of years ago or just a few thousand years ago? That's a great question. I think you'll find out when we go inside the Natural History Museum. Ready to go? Sure, let's go, let's go. Remember that just because scientists say something is true doesn't mean that it is true every time. Right, Doug, right, I got you. Wow, Digger, I see the dinosaurs. This says that dinosaurs lived hundreds of millions of years ago. That can't be right. And notice at the top of this column, did you see that it says humans didn't come along until the dinosaurs were extinct for about 60 million years? Whoa! Don't they have something here that tells it like the Bible says it? That dinosaurs and people were created on the same day of creation, day six? Probably not, Iggy. Well, why do they want us to think dinosaurs are so old? I don't get it. Well, because people who believe in evolution think dinosaurs live millions of years ago because they want to allow lots of time for evolution. Oh, okay, I think I do get it. If God created everything, including dinosaurs and people, in six days like the Bible says, then there's no time for evolution. People who believe in evolution are just trying to make up more time so they can fit evolution into natural history. That's sad, but true, Iggy. That is really sad because there are lots of kids in here who might not know any better. Well, maybe they'll watch our show and learn the truth about dinosaurs. I sure hope so, Digger. I also hope that somebody will start making bigger popcorn bags so my hand can feel. I love popcorn, especially with lots of butter and salt. In fact, I made up this little song. It goes, I love my popcorn. Hello, this is your Weird Worm Willie with an urgent news bulletin. The Natural History Museum is teaching that dinosaurs lived 60 million years prior to humans. Apparently, the owner of the museum, Fossil Fred, does not believe that God created the earth and all the animals in six days, as we find in the Bible. This is big news. I repeat, the Natural History Museum is teaching that dinosaurs lived and became extinct millions of years before humans arrived on the scene.
Perhaps we will know more soon about this strange turn of events. Of course, I will arrive on the scene and keep you posted with the facts. All the facts and nothing but the facts as soon as I know them. This is Willie the Word Worm signing off. This is amazing, Doug. Can I take a picture on camera? Can I, can I? Sure thing, Iggy. All right. I love this. It's such a huge, um, I was looking at it. It's a, uh, oh. Tyrannosaurus I, I, Rex. Yes, thank you. That was on the tip of my tongue. I was about to say it. I really do know a whole lot about dinosaurs. I, excuse me. Would either of you like some popcorn? Uh, that bag is really small. Well, uh, no, no, I don't think so. Not you, today. Uh, we just had dino burgers from Dave's Diner. Oh, I love dino burgers. As a matter of fact, we have a lot of dinosaurs right here in the Natural History Museum. Oh, oh, you work here? Uh, as a matter of fact, I own the place. My name is Fossil Fred. Wow! Uh, pleased to meet you, Fossil Fred. We're just here admiring your dinosaurs. That's great. This dinosaur is over a hundred million years old. Uh, uh, not really. Uh, yes, I'm quite serious. No, I, I mean, dinosaurs aren't really that old. What? We should introduce yes, ourselves. Yes, I think so. I'm Digger Doug from the underground. And I'm Iguanodon. This is my friend yes, Iguanodon. Iguanodon. It's a pleasure to meet you both. Now, explain more about this. What is this about dinosaurs not being old? Well, God created both animals and humans on day six of creation. Dinosaurs did not live millions of years before humans. But, but, but if that's true, then there's no time left for evolution. Right, that's, that's because evolution never happened. Right, right. Wait a minute, I'm a very intelligent and important scientist. And I believe in evolution. I believe that dinosaurs came along millions of years before humans ever arrived on the scene. Well, Doug, I think you might should tell him about the pukukukup. Wait until you hear this fossil free. Iggy, Iggy means petroglyph. Uh, that's what I said. Archaeologists have found very old rock drawings of dinosaurs. Rock drawings like these are called petroglyphs. Scientists realize that men must have either seen a dinosaur or been told about them in order to draw them. Well, of course, I know all about petroglyphs, you understand, but I've never heard of a petroglyph of a dinosaur. This is very interesting. Let's talk more about this over a bag of popcorn. Well, I would, but the bag is so to. small and my hand... Uh, 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 uh. It seems that a discovery of a petroglyph or a rock drawing of a dinosaur may prove that humans and dinosaurs lived during the same time period and not millions of years apart. Here to discuss this vital issue with me is geologist George, an expert in the field of dinosaur petroglyphs. Thanks for coming on our news show, George. Thank you, William. I know you're very busy in the world of geology and natural history. That's about the size of it. But tell me why the discovery of the dinosaur petroglyphs at that Natural Bridges National Monument is such a big deal. It seems that everybody's talking about it. That's about the size of it. These drawings are important because they were made before cameras or videos. Whoever drew these pictures knew about dinosaurs, not because he saw a dinosaur on TV or in a movie. William, whoever drew these pictures had either seen a real dinosaur or he was told about dinosaurs by somebody who knew exactly what they looked like. So the bottom line is that dinosaurs did not live millions of years before humans ever came to be? Well, William, that, that's about the size of it. If dinosaurs became extinct a long time before humans ever came around, then there's no way any human could have known how to draw these kinds of pictures. Are the National Bridges petroglyphs the only ones ever discovered? 
No way, William. In 1924, Samuel Hubbard discovered a rock drawing nearly just like these. It looks just like a dinosaur. Wow! This is great news! Sizing up the news for you today and every day, this is a William! Uh, Willie the Word Worm, signing off for now! He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 He's got the mommies and the daddies in his hands. He's got the mommies and the daddies in his hands. He's got the mommies and the daddies in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the brothers and the sisters in his hands. He's got the brothers and the sisters in his hands. He's got the brothers and the sisters in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the itty bitty babies in his hands. He's got the itty bitty babies in his hands. He's got the itty bitty babies in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Thank you all so much for showing me the truth about dinosaurs. I want you to know that I believe the truth, and there are going to be lots of changes around the Natural History Museum in the coming weeks. Well, thank you too, Foster Fred, but honestly, I can't, I can't really get this back. We'll popcorn. definitely I'm, come back, Fred. Thanks for the popcorn. Uh, speaking of popcorn, I've got some you know, that's stuck I, on I hope that, that you will tell all of the young people who watch your show that I believe the truth about dinosaurs. I don't believe that they came along millions of years before humans ever arrived on the scene. Yeah, it's okay. As long as we've got that settled, let's get on to this popcorn yeah, bag. And it's on it, Don, have you noticed that your bag of popcorn Corn is stuck to your hand. Thank you for letting me in on that, Mr. Fred. Sir, Doug, would you mind helping me remove this bag of popcorn? Yes, from thank one you. Let's, oh, let's, let's, all right. this bag. let's do that. One, two, three. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 look at that. Oh. I'm proud of Fossil Fred. He's a great scientist. He sure is, Iggy. It's wonderful that he can use all his knowledge for good now. Uh-huh, it sure... Oh, here's the mailbag. You know what that means. You better believe I do. Let's see who's written interesting questions to us today. Hmm, here's a question from Billy. Does the moon do anything to the ocean? If so, how does this work? But that's really silly, Billy. The moon doesn't do anything to the ocean. Billy, you ought to know better. Actually, Iggy, the moon has a lot to do with the ocean. Oh, 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 uh, well, please go on. I would tell you all about the moon and the oceans, but I'd like at least to hear what you've got to say about it. Okay, thanks, Iggy. The Earth is about 240,000 miles from the moon. Woo. This is just the right distance because the moon helps to control the movement of the ocean's tides. Tides are created because the Earth and moon are attracted to each other by gravity, just like magnets are attracted to each other. The moon pulls at anything on the Earth to bring it closer. Since the water is always moving, the Earth can't hold on to it, and the moon is able to pull at it. Wow! I didn't know the moon was strong enough to tug on the oceans. That's cool. Speaking of strong, one time I was... The movement of the water, Iggy, is very good for the Earth because it cleans the shorelines and helps ocean life to grow. Tides are very important in ocean currents. Without these currents, the oceans would sit still and the animals and plants living in the ocean would die. Boy, I'm glad we have tides and the moon to make the tides happen. Do we have another question today? Hmm, yeah, as a matter of fact, we do. Would you like to read this one? Oh, sure, sure. Let me see it, Doug. Let me see it. This one is from Marilyn. She asked, where do we get our oxygen to breathe? Why, everybody knows the answer to that one, Doug. Oh, really? Okay, well, you handle this one, Iggy. Oh, yeah, well, all right. Thank you for giving me that particular question because I would like to put it in a very simple way so that everyone could understand it so that people would not be confused by the extrapolations of the complications that I'm about to uh, extrapolate. Well, and... maybe I ought to answer this question. Well, okay, if you'd like to, go ahead. You can have the easy one. Okay. Humans breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. 
Plants, on the other hand, take in carbon dioxide and give off oxygen. Humans depend on the plant world for a constant, fresh oxygen supply. But about half of that oxygen comes from tiny, microscopic plants within the Earth's oceans and seas. Plants convert carbon dioxide to oxygen in a process we call photosynthesis. Oh yeah, photo photosynthesis. That makes sense. Well, it's photosynthesis, Iggy. Oh, of course, of course. I know that explanation helped Marilyn understand about oxygen. Thank you for your excellent question. Blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven are what I can see. When my Lord is living in me, I know that Jesus is as well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Never more will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. All makes me aware of the one who made it all. I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his hope in my heart. Never more will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Oh, that looks great, guys. All right. In this movie, we're going to tell the real story about the dinosaurs. Now, did you learn your line? Oh, yes, sure did. Yeah, I did. Iggy, I've been reading this script a little bit, and it seems like this is not really going to be an educational film. It looks like it's going to be more of okay, an adventure. Okay, okay, I think we should start with a scene where Digger Doug chases the dinosaur across the desert and falls into the deep dark canyon where he has to do some sword fighting with a pirate who rides on the stratoceratops until Digger Doug takes the treasure from him and flies on a huge mosquito and he Iggy. Got, What? What? I'm trying to get this, but what? What? Have you ever tried to help someone who just absolutely refused your help? Well, Tom Holland reminds us of uh, the fact that Jesus tried to help people who would not be helped by the very Son of God himself. Let's join Tom on the Pastime Porch. Now, Spot, there is no way you're going to beat me playing checkers. I've been playing checkers since I was a boy, and I just know that you, I, I know you're a smart dog, but I know you're not smart enough to, oh, well, come on in and let's visit a while. Spot and I would love to have you. Uh, he thinks he can beat me playing checkers, but he just thinks he can. I, I'll admit he, he's a smart dog. He's so smart that if I tell him, don't you be barking while I'm talking to these folks, he won't utter a sound. I, I faithfully promise you. But I want to tell you about this elderly couple I heard about one time. They were just good country folks, salt of the earth kind, honest as the day is long, the best neighbors anybody could possibly imagine. If anyone was sick in the community, uh, the lady would always be there with food. She would not only take food, uh, if the lady was sick, she would mop the floors, she'd sweep the floors, vacuum the floors, wash the dirty clothes, whatever. She, she just knew what needed to be done, and, and she would do it. And her husband, he would help every way that he possibly could. If, if errands needed to be run, he would do those. And so they had a name in the little community where they lived of just being the best neighbors that had ever been. Well, one Saturday night, they were invited to come over to a neighbor's house for a Saturday night dinner. And uh, they were going to make a freezer of ice cream and man, you know, that good old homemade ice cream. So uh, this man and his wife, these great neighbors, they were so excited about getting over there. And so they drove up and, and they're walking up uh, the walkway to the house and the lady's going in front, and the husband is behind, and uh, right before they got to the porch of the house, he said, uh, Maudie, uh, you may want to pull up your hose, and she turned around and smacked him right on the jaw and shocked him. He said, uh, why in the world did you do that? She said, I ain't wearing no hose. Well, 
You know, sometimes people are trying to be helpful, and they can't be helpful, either because uh, they just don't really understand the situation, or uh, maybe they, they, in excitement or something, will say something that uh, is hurtful or embarrassing. But you know, it reminds me of the times that Jesus tried to help people and couldn't. Jesus left the beauty of heaven and the security of the throne of God and came to this earth, was born in a very humble situation, uh, born in a stable, laid in a manger in infancy, and uh, he was not reared in a king's palace. He was not reared with the proverbial silver spoon in his mouth, just had a, a humble type of a dwelling up at Nazareth, and in fact, even was reared in a town that didn't have a good reputation. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? A fellow said, you remember, recorded there in the New Testament. Well, Jesus tried to help people. And he tried to help the whole city of Jerusalem. And uh, they wouldn't let him. Kind of slapped him in the face, if, if I may use that illustration. And so he looked down upon that city one time with tears, and he said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thee under my wings as a hen doth gather her chickens, and you would not. Now that's a sad commentary on the city of Jerusalem. That's a sad commentary on any person today that the Lord wants to help. He wants to save that person from a sinful life. He wants to give them life. In fact, that's one reason he said he came. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus said, I'm come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Not just an existence, a brief existence in a troubled world for a very, very short time, he came that you and I might have a reason for our existence, that we might be reminded that we initially were created, that people were initially created by Almighty God in His own image and after His likeness. And however much that beautiful image of God may be marred or even destroyed, Jesus Christ can bring it back. He can, by the power of His blood, cleanse our souls from all stain of sin. He can make us, as we are baptized into a relationship with Him, He can make us the very children of God Almighty with all the honor involved in that, with the peace it brings to the mind, with the joy it brings to the life, and with the hope it brings to the heart. I'm talking about an abundant life that doesn't end with death. Death becomes a type of door through which we pass for even a, a closer connection to the Lord. And so, Jesus tried to help people, and he's still trying to help people. But unfortunately, sometimes when you try to help people, they either do not realize that you're trying to help, or they may even resent that you're trying to help. But Jesus is in the business of helping us now and saving us forever. Thank you for visiting with me on my porch. And the next time, I will promise you, I will have already beat this little man in any game of checkers that he wants to play. Have a great day. A recent study at UCLA on students' attitudes toward religion. That's the topic of Robert Hatfield's uh, Truth For Youth segment. Coming your way right now. The University of California at Los Angeles recently conducted a study in which their researchers tell us uh, that college students become more spiritual when they enter into college than when they were in high school. Uh, when they say that, more spiritual, what they mean is something that is inside, they're searching for something greater than themselves. And when they say religious, they mean going to worship services. Now, evidently, college students don't do that, according to their definition, uh, but they're doing something seeking some type of religious system. Now we understand what Jesus said in Matthew 15, 13. Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. 
Uh, we read in Ephesians chapter 4 that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. The world today believes in denominationalism, different, quote, faiths, different systems of beliefs. But this study would have us to believe, in fact, listen to this. It says that on the one hand, we have college students who have their own faiths, and on the other hand, uh, they're, they're seeing the viewpoints of their fellow students. And uh, according to this study, college students today are more tolerant of other people's, quote, faiths. Do you understand what that means, though? That means that college students, according to the study conducted at UCLA, are not only more tolerant of other people's religious beliefs and, and quote, interpretations of the Bible, uh, but that also says that they're more tolerant concerning issues like gay marriage and abortion. In fact, so much so that the researchers said, in other words, this generation of students is much more tolerant and accepting than earlier generations. Here's the truth that we need to understand as young people today. It doesn't matter how, more, how much uh, toleration that may be exerted by our fellow peers and by the culture. The psalmist said in Psalm 119 in verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 25, Things of the earth will fade away, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And therefore, the things that the Bible establishes as truth and as absolute are the things that we uphold and stick with. As Christian young people, we're going to be sure that even though we may enter into these types of realms such as UCLA or the college experience, we're going to set, stand firm on that which is right and truthful. We can't be tolerant. You know, we would love to be tolerant of individuals, wouldn't we? We'd love to say, well, you believe your way and I'll believe mine and we're all going to the same place, but that's not what the New Testament teaches. The New Testament teaches that there is one body, the church, that there is one God, there is one Lord, there is one faith, there is one hope, there is singular of these things. And therefore, that's what we believe. We believe the New Testament and we're silent where it is silent, and we speak where it speaks. I'm Robert Hatfield. This has been Truth For Youth. Well, that's it for the Saturday edition of Good News Today. Hope to see you right back here tomorrow for your daily dose of the best news ever. Always good news, good news, good news. There is good news today. There is good news, good news. The world. Always good news, good news. Greetings, everyone. I'm Voice Memos button. Announce notifications button. Selected sound rec code scanner. Sound rec selected. Accessibility shortcuts. Sound rec codes. Apple T camera. Flashlight. Wallet. Timer button. Notes button. Hearing devices. Music recognition button. Selected screen recording.